It's now my honor to introduce our keynote speaker, Pete Corral. A Brunswick native and a 1963 UGA graduate, Mr. Corral is chairman of Atlanta Equity Investors and chairman emeritus of the Georgia Pacific Corporation. He's enjoyed a 40-year career as a successful executive in forest products, paper, and consumer products industries. Mr. Correll oversaw the acquisition and divestiture by Georgia Pacific of companies with a total value of $45 billion during his career. In the process, he led a transformation of the company from a commodity forest products concern to an international company with a major emphasis on consumer brands. He serves as an outside director on the boards of the Norfolk Southern Corporation and SudTrust Banks, both based in the Southeast, and he is chairman of the board of Grady Memorial Hospital Corporation. Mr. Correll, though, is the consummate UGA alumnus, avidly supporting our university with his time and talents. We are very grateful for his excellent representation of our university and our alumni, and I would ask you to join me in welcoming Pete Corral. Pete. Thank you, Jerry. And thank you for having me speak to you tonight. Um, it's truly to be a, an honor to be part of a celebration of so many Georgia graduates. You folks have done what so many dream of. You've built businesses, created jobs, improved communities, and made our state a better place. Over the years, Georgia has consistently turned out people who've made a difference. Of course, the ranking of the university and the ranking of the Terry Business School are now such that we should expect no less. However, that's not always been so. When I graduated from Georgia and the Business School in 1963, at that time we were ranked at the bottom of every list and had a losing football team. <laughs> Well, that's not exactly true. We were constantly at the, ranked at the top of Playboy's ranking of party schools. <laughs> In fact, num one year we were number one. When I gave the commencement address at Georgia last year, I congratulated the class for pulling Georgia back up in the party school rankings so that we were now again in the top five. <clears throat> I must admit that I hate it that we're behind Florida, but I guess there's some hope. <laughs> Yet even in that era, Georgia turned out people who led in the business world. About 10 years ago, I was in Davos, Switzerland at the World Economic Forum, and on the program with me was Saxby Chambliss, Pat Mitchell, then head of PBS, and Bobby McTeer, then head of the Dallas, Dallas Fed, who later became Chancellor of Texas A&M. All of us were at Georgia partying together in the 60s. <laughs> As you can tell from my resume, I'm a corporate animal. I grew up in the world of big business. Regardless of the size of the business, you need three things to succeed. The product, the people, and the resources to execute the strategy. Of those items, the hardest to manage is the people, and then in the final analysis, they are the most important. As I began to become competitive in the corporate game, I was constantly asked how a kid from Georgia with graduate education from Maine could ever compete in the world of people with top schools. Of course, I never knew the answer, but I spent a lot of time thinking about it, and I guess I now understand the value of my Georgia experience. This would be a much better speech if I could tell you of a favorite professor I had who changed my life and taught me some things that made a difference, but unfortunately that's not so. 
I have many wonderful memories of Georgia, but none of them happened in the classroom. <laughs> so it was not what I learned in the classroom and it was not that when I graduated, I could recite verbatim the small wording at the top of a Budweiser can, <laughs> although that was tremendously entertaining. <laughs> I think what Georgia did for all of us was give us a chance to grow our social and people skills so that we were comfortable in any environment and we could fit in anywhere. Big, wild parties with their noise, chaos, are great training for business. <laughs> I was the social chairman of our fraternity. <laughs> and other than the business training of hiring Sam Cooke, the Platters, and the Isley Brothers for parties, <laughs> the biggest challenge I had was to control the chaos to be sure that the house was still standing on Sunday morning. There was a many a day when I was CEO of Georgia Pacific that I was doing the same thing. <laughs> Trying to control the chaos so the place was standing the next morning. In addition, I've become to understand that large corporations are also great educational institutions. There are subject matter experts everywhere. And as Yogi Berra once said, you can observe a lot just by watching. I was still learning the day I walked out the door at age 66. I've always followed the KISS principle of business. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> My experience at Georgia Pacific is a prime example of how you can overcomplicate things and simple solutions are usually the ones that work. When I came to Georgia Pacific in 1988, we were the largest building products company in the world and the second largest timber owner in the United States. We had a small paper business that was very low cost and growing very fast, and the company was committed to grow that business through acquisition. We had two big problems. Building products was very cyclical, and the world does not value timber, timber assets in a C corporation with double taxation. Our tax structure and double taxation of dividends makes timber ownership problematic for corporations. Those two issues made the market put a big value on our cash flows, a big discount on our cash flows. Our timber business was the most complex. We owned six million acres of prime timber land in the south and on the west coast but that land could only supply 13% of our timber needs. So the obvious but painful conclusion was that we did not need to own trees. If we could, own, if we could buy 87% of our timber needs, we could obviously buy 100%. Back then it was heresy to think that a forest products company did not need to own a forest. But we concluded that we did not. The industry thought we were nuts. Our employees thought we were destroying the company, but the stock market thought we were brilliant. So we created a letter stock called the Timber Company, traded it independently on the New York Stock Exchange for two years, and then, then did a reverse Marsh Trust merger with Plum Creek and spun our timberland into their REIT structure tax-free and immediately created over a billion dollars of value for our shareholders. Now, 10 years later, no forest products company owns timberland unless they've changed their corporate structure to a REIT. The cyclicality issue was more fun. <clears throat> there was no way to make a building products company not cyclical, so we concluded that we had to build a non-cyclical paper business that was a cash machine. As an aside, when we talked about building products being cyclical, never in our wildest dreams or worst nightmares did we foresee anything like we've been through as a country the last few years. 
these past few years have redefined the term cyclical and brought back the hope that, may, that maybe the business is cyclical, which means it'll come back someday. <laughs> Our problem was and is for the industry that the paper business is also cyclical. It tracks business cycles almost perfectly. In addition, some paper products like newsprint are simply going away at an alarming rate. So paper is cyclical and demand is increasing as the electronic revolution finally arrives. So when you think about it, what paper product has non-cyclical demands? Think a minute. What paper product has non-cyclical <laughs> demands? That's right, toilet paper. Ninety-eight and half, uh, point five percent of Americans say they use it every day. <laughs> we never tried to find out what the other one point five percent were doing, or to convince them to try it. <laughs> I've always said there's some things in life you simply do not want to know the answer to. So we set out to be the biggest toilet paper and towel company in the world and we did it based on a superior cost position. We built brands like Quilted Northern, Angel Saw, Brownie, Sparkle. We bought brands like Dixie Cups and Plates, and we concentrated on the mass retail market. We took the old sick roll pack to 24 and 36, so no housewife can get it easily into a shopping cart. <laughs> and the consumers absolutely loved it. The New York Times called me the toilet paper king, and I've said many times I was glad my mother did not live long enough to know what her son spent his time doing and thinking about. <laughs> the market valued what we were doing, and luckily for our shareholders, the Koch brothers valued it more, and Georgia Pacific was sold to Koch in December of 2005. Gulo Georgia Logic created a lot of value back then and continues to do so today as evidenced by the people in this room. You know, the University of Georgia is a special place. It's been 50 years since Italy and I graduated and the school has changed so much it's hard to recognize. Mike Adams and before him Chuck Knapp have turned the Southern Party School into a leading academic institution. I accuse them both openly of screwing up four to five years of fun <laughs> of young people's life with all this education crap. <laughs> but in fact, they have not. Georgia has been able to explode the academic level while at the same time remembering that the college years are supposed to be the most fun years of your life. So tonight, an old guy like me to, can, can come to a dinner celebrating what you youngsters have accomplished and feel a tie that goes back to a special time and a special place called the University of Georgia. Thank you, and go dogs. Oh, that's terrific. Thank you. Pete, thank you for those remarks. Obviously, this audience uh, was inspired by them. <laughs> and as a token of our appreciation for your participation in this evening's event, we placed a book in the library uh, in your honor. And the, but, but the title of this book is appropriately The Virtues of Leadership, Contemporary Challenges for Global Managers by Arminio Rigo. And tonight I'm pleased to present you with a replica of the book plate that will be in the library, which reads, presented to A.D. Pete Carell by the UGA Alumni Association in appreciation for his extraordinary role as the keynote speaker for the Bulldog 100 event. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you.